Hello, welcome to Soul One's Lab. I'm Michael Yang and Patrick. Wow, it's so much better to be back in the studio. I know, right? I mean, I really enjoyed our episode that we did at AWS reInvent, but it was really loud and I was afraid we we're going to get run over by a forklift. Hey, you don't have to wear that huge headset mic, but the feedback was great. And you really seem to enjoy the interest in the challenge of monitoring modern distributed application infrastructure and application tracing. Yeah, and that's true. I mean, I've been spending most of my time now on cloud deployments and especially helping our customers that are sort of doing both, that are managing both enterprise and cloud. But it's interesting that, you know, based on the chat that we had last time is how many of you, I mean, even if you're still mostly on-premises, have, if not outright distributed architectures, at least multi-element applications that rely really heavily on APIs. And tracing them really does turn out to be the only way to monitor them. That's right, and the classic application stack is beginning to become less and less monolithic. Mm -hmm. And that's what we wanted to talk about today, uh, digital experience monitoring. So you want me to just go ahead and ask the question that I had the first time that I heard the acronym DEM? Sure, you're going to ask anyway. Okay, well, <laughs> isn't digital experience monitoring just the same as web performance monitoring or RUM, you know, real user monitoring, something that's just hammering on uh, a URL of a web server? Well, no. <laughs> Let's break down the monitoring to internal and external observability, right? Ooh. Internal observability are using metrics, log, traces for application and mm -hmm. infrastructure monitoring. Right. And we have fantastic cloud products like AppOptics, PaperTrail, and now Logly for it. Right, it's like detail component dense. Absolutely. It's about optimizing your cloud application infrastructure using the right set of tools. However, What's also really important is the external observability. What does the experience look like for external perspective, user perspective? Ah, so not just if you're DevOps, but actually if you're regular operations, you need to know whether your websites are up or down or performing poorly before in customers do or before uh, worse, maybe a business stakeholder actually picks up the phone and calls you. You know, uh, a little bit more than just up down, right? Like, is it performing better or worse than yesterday? Responding to changes that you may have made in the infrastructure, or is it responding better from the U.S. than it is from Asia or from uh, Europe? You know, that's right. I mean, DevOps or ops person need to monitor both external and internal observability, and you also often feed external observability and these type of information to internal observability for correlations. Right, and it's what people used to call end-user experience monitoring. So how is that different, really, than digital experience monitoring? Well, there are two key, really, differences. First, it's not about just human or end-user experience of the website. Right. It's also about machine-to-machine -machine or API-to-API -API integration. This is, the pro this is the point where you're trying to bait me with the, with the acronym API to say, is it part of the API economy? Ding, ding, ding. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and you just did it. Well, I was uh, successful at it. Uh, let me give you an example on one of the largest real estate management companies in the world. They use Salesforce SaaS-based marketing solution, and they build internal application that links to Salesforce marketing solutions via API to API integration. Sure. They need to know whether Salesforce API is up and running properly, its API performance is acceptable. Guess what solution uh, they use to monitor Salesforce API integration and its performance? Pingdom. You're a genius, Patrick. Uh, that is absolutely correct. Uh, they use Pingdom to monitor as well as use Pingdom to report to have SLA and yearly contract discussion. Money, money. Uh, they like Salesforce, but they need to independent and leading solution that can provide unbiased data. Right, trust, but, ver but verify. I get it. And, and there's something else about that too. Is it's not just you know when we're negotiating the contracts, do we get a better deal or do we get a refund for poor performance? It's just ensuring that we get the SLA that we expect and that we're paying for. We don't want a discount. We want great performance from that vendor. Yeah, you know, Salesforce, we trust you, but we'd like to verify. Right. <laughs> the second item that's really important for digital experience monitoring is that website performance is more than just techie issue. Business stakeholders like chief marketing officers really care about web website performance insight. Yeah, they really do, and they care about it maybe in a slightly different way, you know, because if you're an administrator and you're focused on delivering that service, you know, you're really thinking about kind of feeds and speeds. And so the metrics that you're really thinking about, like, uh, you know, website performance, uh, capability, memory utilization, all of the elements of the infrastructure are a little bit different, right? So if you're talking about uh, the business owners, that they're actually looking at things like uh, conversion or engagement or all of that fluffy marketing fluffy, stuff, fluffy. right? <laughs> because it's tied to their bonus, right? Like, for example, our our uh, CMO, Darren, right, he's 
he cares if SolarWinds goes down, but that's not really likely. SolarWinds.com is pretty reliable, right? But what is more likely is a performance issue, and that has a direct impact on Darren's bottom line, which is customer acquisition. Patrick, that is an awesome example. CMOs for business stakeholders that do online business, which nowadays is everyone, right? Mm -hmm. Really cares about website performance insight. There are a number of studies which directly correlate website performance to site visitors and customer acquisitions. Customers, personally, myself, you know, you don't want to stick around that site that's too, too slow. I would rather go to some competitor site that would give me a fast performance. Right, and you'll see things like changes in maybe uh, upsell numbers based on how long they sit, spend dwelling on the site or how many different additional uh, uh, items you might be able in a shopping cart to present in a short period of time while they're actually kind of in that, that mood to be loading up the cart. Excellent. So then the goal then is to correlate the metrics that business cares about, like site session and balance rate, to the metrics that we typically keep an eye on, like responsiveness, page views, and page load time. You know, that's correct. And we'll use Pingdom as an example to give you some recommendations on how to use your tools to combine everything into a single view. Awesome. So this is going to be Pingdom Visitor Insights combined with uh, DIM metrics. So let's do it this way. Um, let's talk a little bit more about DIM, what it is and what it isn't, and how customers like you are actually um, asking for new features and what your specific challenges around monitoring are, especially monitoring dependencies, not just performance at the browser. And then we're going to get into demo. As long as I get to demo on the touch screen, I'm good, Patrick. And hey, one more other thing. We've had lots of questions about Logly, mm. what is it and how it's different from Paper Trail? Okay, so for Logly, do I get to do that one? Because I really want to compare them side by side because I am a bit of a logging nerd. Logging nerd? You just called me a nerd. Nerd. So Patrick, let me show you. So what you're seeing is a Pingdom Visitor Insight, and the first thing that you'll notice is that how easy it is to notice some key metrics that we talked about around right. the user experience and business metrics. So Because these dashboards, you want to try to make sure that your dashboards are designed to be easy to read, not just for you and operations. Because we can dig through huge dashboards all day long. We're great at that. But like if you actually have, let's say, a CMO who's looking at some of these metrics, they need to be easy for them to understand too. Uh, that's perfect, Patrick. Yeah, that's exactly the point. So one other thing you'll notice is that, for example, some of the fluffy metrics we talked about, mm -hmm. you see it right in front of you, right? Active sessions. So on this particular website, which is Dad Host, which is a game hosting website. It's all about Dad Host. Uh, Dad Host. Um, it is. Uh, so you see that on this website, you have number of active sessions. Right mm -hmm. now is 100 active sessions. And this is, we had 121 one hour ago, one day ago, one week ago. It's really simple and right at your fingertips. So for gaming, that would be a measure of engagement. Exactly, right? Number of people that's coming to the gaming website. Along with that, some of the information you see is what's the load time, right, aggregator across the that host website, which is right now 6.32 seconds. Obviously, it's just going to change as throughout the day. And this is what the average looked like one hour ago, which is 3.42, 4.8 one day ago, and one week ago, right? And we're going to get into the details of that. But at this, at this level, you might be monitoring, let's say, the top level page that's going to contain all of the JavaScript logic, images, everything else. So that would be like the full load time to sort of get that initial experience. That is absolutely correct. Not only the front load time, but the network time and the back end time as well. Right. So when it really takes um, you know, three seconds, seven seconds, what is that really related to, right? Right. And uh, some other metrics you see is that things like bounce rate. So obviously, if your website is really slow, people are going to come and say, well, you know what, this website is too slow. I'm going to bounce right out. I'm going to go to your competitor website, right? So you can start to correlate some of the load time, active sessions, page views. Mm -hmm. and uh, app deck score associated with some of the business metrics associated with website performance. Okay. And one other thing you'll notice is that, again, as a person, as a business, you may have a multiple websites, right? So you can <laughs> add Absolutely. that host, mm -hmm. or you could add things like pingdom.com or pingdom tools or different websites associated with that. Okay. So then these are, in this case, you're monitoring a bunch of lab servers. Exactly. Yeah. Well, live servers and, you know, live, yeah, yep. we're absolutely monitoring a live servers, right? Yep. So this kind of tells you, this from dashboard tells you, do I have a problem on website, right? And those problems, are they related? And how can I correlate those problems and performance metrics with some of the business metrics that we talked about and okay. see it in an easy to consume manner? 
Right. So then that conversation is now you and the CMO or maybe you and someone else uh, who's a, a manager over part of the business. So then the next question you're going to ask is, okay, now I need to figure out what is causing, let's say, a performance issue. Then it kind of comes back to, to us in operations in detail. Patrick, that's perfect. So this tells you, first of all, do I have an issue on my website mm -hmm. right? across multiple sites? The next thing you want to know is where, who within my audience is having that issue? Right. The third is, what is my root cause behind that issue? Got it. So what we're about to see is, let's go to the next step, which is who within my website audiences or visitors are having this issue? So let me take an example. I'll just click through this uh, dat host website. Mm -hmm. And you see here is that, again, some of the key informations like active session, load time, app tax score, and bounce rate. Hey, look at this, world map. And that looks like light speed time to me right there. Yeah, so you see here is that, you know, our, uh, our users in Sweden and Nordic countries and UK, they are green, but you know, maybe the people in the US is not having a great experience for that host website. And uh, we want to kind of really drill into that, right? So what we can do at this point is obviously you can filter by the country. So you can go and what the active sessions, the load time looks like across US, Brazil, Germany. You can also look at like the platform information, like what is the experience looks like on desktop, phone, and tablet. Obviously, if someone's coming from come and checking out that host website mm -hmm. from a um, a bus that you're on on a 3G network, that's going to be really slow, right? Right. So we want to filter those out there as well, or be able to see some of those correlations associated with that, not just country, but where, what devices, and so on and so forth. Well, especially if you're trying to make decisions about investment in the primary interface for an application, right? So yeah. as we've sort of hit that point, according to a lot of surveys, where we're now 50-50 or maybe even leading now mobile over desktop. So you're deciding as a part of your application design, what you're promoting is whether people are having that mobile mobile experience that application or they're going from their regular desktop. So you're making decisions about investment based on responsiveness or sort of the experience that users are having by platform. Right? Absolutely. It's not just, hey, this thing responds in so many seconds. So that's that's all I care about. Exactly. So that information, like where, like who's having who's having that audience and who's having that problem, right? Right. And this feature I really like to check this out. This is really cool. So what I can do at this point is as a user I can go in and edit and say, you know what? If the response, the, if the page load time is anywhere between zero to three seconds, we'll say green. But let's say my threshold is a little higher. So let's say if the page load time is zero to five seconds, we'll say green, right? So what you got to see here is that once I save this, the graphics around this is going to change. So what you will see here is that, for example, we had a mm -hmm. US region that was yellow because uh, we made a threshold a little higher where we say the definition of green is anywhere from zero to five seconds. Now you see certain regions becoming green again. And you're making that as an informed decision based on satisfaction for users as indicated by other metrics. Like in the case of engagement, for example, you can say, you know, yeah, it is performing a little more slowly because just uh, latency across the uh, undersea cables, right? But if your other business metrics are telling you that you're getting great engagement, you can make that decision and say, you know what, that, that's, a, that's green, that's okay, that's acceptable status. Yeah, maybe your hosting vendor or your data center is in the US. So obviously people coming into US would be a little faster than the people that's coming from Europe or vice versa, mm -hmm. right? And what you can see here is that throughout seeing those information, you can do it through a top country by session, top platform. So for those users that's coming in, are they mostly coming through the desktop, phone, and tablet? Obviously here, we're in mobile right. world, so you're seeing a lot more phone and tablets mm -hmm. coming to that host website. And you guys see like different sessions, the active sessions that we have, and what is that, you know, where are the users that are coming from? So obviously with the desktop, you'll tend to have a longer sessions associated mm -hmm. with that. So you'll see information like desktop has higher engagement at this point. Right. right? Uh, different browsers. Um, I don't know if anybody uses uh, browser outside Chrome, but obviously in this data, people do. Oh, look, there's Edge. Like oh, Opera. No, when was the last time you saw an Opera browser, huh? <laughs> um, and you see, uh, you know, obviously Chrome, Firefox, and AppDax. And you see different like low time distribution by page views. And this feature I really like. So when you start to look at like page load time for that host or pingdom.com or your website, uh, you see that those load times as an aggregator across 
all of your pages on your website, right? Right. But what this shows you is that you can kind of break those down by like each individual pages, right? And what this provides is obviously your homepage, thathost.com, mm -hmm. that shows the most page views, obviously has the certain average load time associated with that. And what we do is we combine this number and you say, hey, total load time for this um, default homepage is you know, one day, two hour, 45 minutes. So you aggregate, you add the page view numbers and average load time associated with that. So that's total number of views if it was one person, how long they would be sitting to load all of those? Videos? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Right. So total page view. So what you want to do here is that you want to optimize the, your particular websites and page, right, mm -hmm. associated with your website. But obviously, you want to focus your effort, for example, on your homepage, which doesn't surprise you. This is where the most users are coming. And if the average load time is really high, you want to optimize that, even if it's. Uh, faster compared to your other pages, but this is a page you want to really optimize because this is where all a lot of your users are coming in. Right, right. or uh, many of uh, our viewers actually probably have multiple platforms or technologies that are actually composite uh, components of the overall website, right? So yeah. you're trying to break out sort of the fields about a domain because you know you think you know primary top level domain blah 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 and then the name but really there's like in the case of SolarWinds there's SolarWinds Cloud there's Portal um, there's um, like in product the, pages product pages all the rest of it support pages and so that this is to untangle that sort of nebulous how do how do how do people feel like if someone yeah. says how do people feel about our website well this is to say i can tell you based on the subcomponents of that website what the metrics are telling us are actually great performing areas of our website or ones where we need to invest as opposed to the way it normally works which is and eh, people say the website's slow well that's almost like you know the network's down yeah. no the, where the web, <laughs> where i can't do anything what do that. i need to focus on right. optimizing right and another great example uh, is you can add and you can group pages as an example uh -huh. and aggregate those information here. So I'll give you an example. Like let's say, well, I, I'm sure many of you guys are running or managing e-commerce site. So as an e-commerce site, maybe uh, you want to group all the product pages together right? and look at the number of page views that's coming into like the, all the product pages as well as average load time associated with that. Okay. So you can slice and dice very easily any way which way you want to do it. right? Group these product pages, or if you want to group certain pages, that's very important for you. Maybe you want to group blocks, right? All the blog pages. Right. So you can, uh, you can again, you can slice and dice. Or, or, really might, or for some businesses, um, it might actually be by business unit. Yeah. That's a great example, right? So then you'd recommend doing custom dashboards, sort of by group for those users, so that yeah. you could actually have different executives in different areas of the business with their own dashboard? Yeah, exactly. The different ways that you can kind of prioritize it, and there are different uh, subcomponents of your website that, that different personas wants to focus on. You could provide those customization for you for Pingdom. Okay. Um, then, uh, obviously, scrolling further down, you have the, uh, the load time, again, uh, you know, load time associated with different countries and different platforms. Very easy to use metrics and visualization that you can use as well. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you have different page views and the active sessions. Again, th the thing that I wanted to highlight here is it different ways to slice and dice information. And one other thing, um, you know, we've done a lot of um, user engagement and customer interviews to come up with this right. great digital experience monitoring. One of the features that I like a lot is the fact that see that green line here in terms of page views associated with that, mm -hmm. and this gray line here is like what that was looks like exactly a 24 hours ago. So Got you it. can start to kind of compare in terms of what this page view looks like uh, now versus 24 hours ago. So you can kind of get a different perspective now. Can you just do it against 24 hours so again? No, you can do it things like, you want to see the page views across, let's say, seven days, right? And once you start to kind of see this information seven days ago, is that what, what, what did that look like uh, you know, exactly a week ago, right? right? So what the blue line sees is your like, timeline for the last seven days, and what your gray line shows is that what that information looked like like seven days ago, right? So it. it's, again, shows you like different correlation, and you could do that if you go back to 30 days, so 30 days now versus 30 days ago, right? So it's a great way to kind of correlate in terms of the page views, the active sessions, and your you know, performance information on your website against what you're getting now versus what you were getting before. Well, and it also makes it easy to kind of answer that or make curiosity self-serve, right? So if you have if you have someone, especially uh, maybe they're part of the marketing team, and they want to know 
how are we doing? What's the yeah. trend? It lets them go in and actually interactively explore that on their own without saying, hey, would you generate me yet another report? Yeah, it's sort of like, you know, website seems really slow today, <laughs> right? You're like, okay, what is that perspective of? Like, what did, what did the uh, website performance look like 24 hours ago? Right. Or even like seven days ago, And right? then they go answer that question, but they never open a ticket. Yeah. They don't ever send you an email. It just seems slow, right? <laughs> right, but they can actually go and say, well, you know, I look at back seven days ago, I look back at last month, it wasn't spiking like this. This is just so strange, they say out loud. And then the person next to them turns and says, well, remember we did that promotion that drove all the traffic, oh, oh yes, actually, historically, this has been performing great. But it lets them figure that out on their own without, without going to ops, right? Without going to operations and saying, hey, can you, but we want to do some reporting. Well, do your own reporting. Yeah. You don't need me to Come do here, that. I'll give you the link. I it's easy. A, Anybody can do it. Even yeah. my mother can do it. <laughs> I, I, I need to deliver these services. I don't need to get in the business of writing their own reports. It makes that self-service for them. OK, great. So what you're seeing here is there again, just to kind of walk through the process again. One, do I have an issue on my website? Who's having this issue? This is exactly what we're seeing. And what's the root cause? So let's look at the root cause. So what I do here is I go to the top. I click on the performance tab. And, and this basically tells you the basic root cause. So when people say, well, the load time is, you know, page load time on average is 2.11 seconds on my website, right? Okay. The thing that is important is that what component of the page load time is related to the front end mm -hmm. or the back end? Sure. Right? The front end meaning, oh, hey, if someone's you know, looking at the website from a bus on a 3G mobile devices, yeah, it's going to be slow versus someone that's on Google's gigabit network, right? And using desktop, right? right. So this shows you, yeah, it's a page load time is 2.09 seconds, but the back end component of it, which is the first uh, time to first byte, that's, you know, uh, the server and application in the back end is presented that information to the front end, it only took 0 0.39 seconds. Majority of the time was 2.90 seconds was spent on the client, pro uh, client front end, right? right? So it's really the browser processing, you know, different JavaScripts mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, different CSS loads associated with that. So you, as a DevOps and ops worker, can say, yeah, you know the page load second in this example the the website is loading really fast but let's say it was like you know 8 seconds right. website seemed really slow i'm looking at this metric and you can go back and say hey on the server end it really took you know less than a second it's really the client processing end mm -hmm. that's taking a long time that could be related to different components it, again it could be someone that's riding a bus and rural road, and they're right. on a 3G mobile devices, right? Well, and also it lets you sort of look at overall experience by complexity of the application, right? Because if I can come into these slices and immediately break this out, right? So time to first byte, that's basically TCP connect time, right? Uh, think time, that's how much time um, I'm actually doing processing on the back end. Load time, how long does it take to get it? But client processing time? If I have super heavy client-side JavaScript, I've got a really rich interface, and it takes a long time for that mobile device to process it. If the the uh, experience, if their the their association or their assessment is this thing is slow, well, that might tell me I would rather trade more backend processing to simplify the data that's actually being sent out, or I need to slim down my application or consider maybe a different uh, framework because that is a tax that's being placed on the user experience that's really not anybody's fault. It's just the devices that are distributed in the field, for whatever reason, are spending a lot of time thinking about what I'm sending them. Exactly. And this is why the end user or digital experience monitoring is a really component. Like, started to break that down and say, OK, user is facing really slow website. And people are saying that our website is slow, right? You can break that down. Like, who within my audience is having that issue. Right. And if you know that two people are definitely having that issue, is that what is it related to? Is it the client side front end? Is it back end? Or is it the network, right? right. So it gives you a quick information associated with that. It's experience, not yeah. time. Yeah. It's just an experience, mm -hmm. right? And not only that, you can go this further down. So you can go and say, hey, is it let me break this down further. And it's like, is it again the front end side, or is it the network side, or right. is it the uh, the back end side, right? What's Nowadays, with you know, discussions around net neutrality, maybe people start to throttle things down on nope. the network end. So maybe the that's, that's brand kind of, new. That's never been going on. <laughs> so maybe this is related to the network, right? But obviously, a lot of the time for this particular example, uh, is most of the uh, the processing time in terms of the page load time associated with that is right. the 
client front end. And we can break this down by rendering time, mm -hmm. dome, and you can get a different breakdowns, right? Even on the back end, what's the back end related to send or receive request? Right. And you can even break that in as well. So it gives you information from high level, right, to the uh, page load time into the detailed breakdown of the root cost behind your website. All right, so this is, I don't want to say this is RUM plus, but there are elements of RUM here in terms of being able to actually have metrics that go all the way out to the browser and back, but it also includes the business metrics. Now, I think for a lot of us, when we have uh, been able to get those metrics, what we have to do is customize applications or do code injection or something else. So how is this different? I mean, what do I have to do to my applications to get them instrumented like this? You know, that's a great question. I mean, again, going back to what you said, like, this is visitor insight or digital experience monitoring is all about providing that real user experience monitoring. But what's really unique and different about it is the fact that we can add the business metrics associated with that, like right. things like bounce rate, things like session. So if I'm having a problem with my website and trying to correlate whether or not that performance, website performance has real direct impact on the business side, we can actually show that, right? And the thing is that we can provide that information in really simple, intuitive UI, like I said, Anybody can come in, even the business stakeholder can then see that. Now, right. how do we make this really happen in terms of the installation process? Great question, Patrick. It's really simple. It's a one line like JavaScript injection, and I can show you what that looks like. That'd be great, because you know I'm always going to go to code. Yeah. <laughs> so, what you add that is, again, go to the, the very first page, right? And you showed, we showed in terms of different websites that we're monitoring. Mm -hmm. And what you do here is an add website and you type in your URL. So let's say maybe you want to monitor appoptics.com. There you go. Monitor the monitor. Yeah, monitor the monitor, right? And what you do is here, all you need to do is inject this JavaScript injection, right? Send the code, instruct in my login email, and that's all you have to do. OK. What I really like is being able to, if I want to cut and paste this, this is great. But a lot of times, you're going to send this to a developer. Or maybe it's someone who is a developer, and they are monitoring a particular application. So you would have given them a login anyway. So they're logged in as themselves. By checking that box, it's going to send the snippet, but also all the instructions that they need to them as an email so that if they need to send it to somebody else, if they want to throw it up in Slack, if they want to put it somewhere where uh, someone else on the team can get it, it makes it easy to distribute that. Absolutely. It's just an easy way to kind of send that information. And if you need to send it to your admins or your servers, that's not you, and it's really easy. Right. Well, I mean, I'm always going to want to make that part of my build process. I'm also going to want to test that. Because right? you, your developers are hard. At heart, but, <laughs> but the, the metrics that are available here aren't just in the dashboard, right? I mean, you've got an API that you can get at all of these, that all of these as well, right? Yeah. I mean, if you want to have a really easy way to kind of use the API component of the Pingdom, yeah, mm -hmm. we have that available. We have public APIs to do exactly that. Because, because in my mind, the way that you do this is you're going to add this. I mean, the, the development team, obviously, is going to be involved, if, if not leading, adding the, the uh, Rum and, uh, code into the application, right? Exactly. So if, as a part, if I have a, uh, as a part of my test suite that I've built for that app, I have an automated test that actually goes to look based on the content um, uh, of for this monitor that actually goes to look, am I getting data back off of my uh, dev site, for example? Um, or you're doing uh, blue-green deployment or uh, you know, limited functionality where some user groups are getting it and some of it wouldn't, you'd be able to programmatically test to see that you were getting metrics back as you would expect for those users as well. So not just am I getting metrics, but as the developer who's responsible for injecting this code to make sure that I've got that rich metrics data, I'm getting the business level metrics that they're always going to be in there every time I deploy. And so then if I'm the ops person, I don't have people run down the hall and say, hey, I need you to go in and modify source. No, no, no. You gave me the, the, the deployment package. I, I don't want to modify that. That's up to you. You, get, you check in the change and then automatically see it be deployed. No, exactly. And this is what's great about Pingdom Visitor Insight is the fact that you know, with that one line JavaScript injection, right, you can send it to anybody or you can do it yourself. And immediately thereafter that, you could start to see some of the key performance insights that you were looking for that you can start to share with someone like CMOs, right, and say, hey, is our website, does it seem slow? Is it anybody within a particular region or country or 
counties that's having a problem? And how do I correlate those business metrics like active sessions or bounce rate with the performance insights like page load time, right? And slice and dice that information across different um, you know, pages and different right. categories within your website, right? Okay, well you know me. I mean, this, this, is, this is great, and I love the idea of being able to put up dashboards for the CMO, that, and then I'm gonna be able to use them to actually make a difference. But I like to actually experiment first to decide whether or not it's helpful and sort of how it works. So um, for our audience, you guys are telling us increasingly that this is a, this is a pretty big challenge, right? You might be a, an all-in uh, web application shop that spends most of your time in operations developing, uh, deploying and uh, delivering web applications, or maybe just a little bit of, of what you do. But um, I want them to have a chance to experiment with this more than just a couple of weeks. So um, how can they try this out and see if, they, if, if it's helpful and also learn about how digital uh, experience monitoring works. Yeah, actually it's simple. So we created a special URL for the audiences. And what you can do is go to www.pingdom.com slash lab. That's right. So pingdom.com, there is actually a Solowinds Lab URL at the end of that. So go by there. It'll have all the details uh, uh, on, on how to do it. But the cool thing is they're actually going to get 90 days, 90 days to experiment with it. And, and we're doing that especially for this episode because we really want to know how this works for you because you're telling us certainly at reInvent and uh, the chat that we had on the last uh, episode that we did that this is increasingly a problem even if you think that you're otherwise entirely on-prem. Uh, this is actually a challenge that the most kind of classic enterprise the enterprise customers are beginning to have. So I, I, I would love to get your feedback on this and to, to talk a little bit more about the challenges that you're having to kind of continue that dialogue. Yeah, and I just wanted to highlight that it's not a you know a subset or a limited functionality. It's a full functionality for 90 days. And at the end of the day, we want you to be successful and try it. Awesome. And try like, you know, what we talked about. So that is digital experience monitoring. Well, you know what I'm going to want to talk about next, right? Logging. Exactly. Logging is Maybe not a central preoccupation of most of our audience, but it doesn't matter whether they have monolithic infrastructures that are running on a small set of servers in their data center, or they are all out on the cloud, or something in between, or um, they are uh, citizens of the, the API uh, ecosystem and the API economy. But th there's a ton of monitoring that, that just has to be done. It's like, you know, you brush your teeth every day, you need to be monitoring all of your uh, systems in a way that you can actually capture uh, events that will le let you do troubleshooting, especially after the fact. Um, it is increasingly complicated, and I think it's a question that you guys have been asking a lot, which is why would we have two different logging products that are part of our cloud portfolio? How does, you know, is that just for cloud? Does it work on premises? What's the, what's the point? And so I wanted to take a chance and uh, take a little bit of time and kind of walk through that, right? So what is the difference between paper trail and Logly, and how does that fit in with the other challenges of grabbing events no, that's, uh, in a distributed fashion? That's a great question, Patrick. And I will go a step further. So let's take another step back, right? So when we say logging solution, Solowinds has a fantastic log solution that's based on on-prem. So this is where I would start. So if you have a, a log solution that you want to store those logs on-premise, we have a fantastic set of products that does that. Now, if you want to have a logging solution that's SaaS-based, where it's okay for you to aggregate those logs and mm -hmm. send those logs, and be it in a simple, easy to manner in a SaaS environment, right. then we have a solutions for that as well. So for those solutions, we have PaperTrail and Logly. Now, what's the difference between Logly and PaperTrail? PaperTrail is a SaaS-based log aggregation solution, meaning mm -hmm. if you have a, a multiple places where you're getting, you're generating logs, whether it's servers or applications, multiple places, if you want to see it in a single place, mm -hmm. get it up and running in minutes, right, and be able to do a live telling or troubleshooting use cases, right? A lot of times, how do people use logs? People use logs if there is something goes wrong, right? And if there is a troubleshooting use cases, you don't want to log into like three, four, eight different places to look at logs, right? You want to see all those logs in a sing single place where it's easy to look at some of those logs associated with different troubleshooting utilities you want to do. And that's what Paper Trail is great at. Well, I don't want to say that it makes me lazy, but it, it makes me lazy. Uh, because the, the challenge uh, with log aggregation has typically been you know that you need to capture 
uh, events that are coming out of your systems. You, you just do. And then you've got to figure out where you're going to send that. So then that get, turns into an infrastructure question, and I'm going to have to build something that is my aggregator, and now that's effectively big data if I start sending enough to it that it's actually doing something useful, and I've got to maintain that, and I've built one more thing. And then sooner or later, you just get to where you say, you know what? I'll come back to those logs and I'll get them later. That, that spark of that moment when you said, I should log this, is lost because you're thinking about the weight, that's the, the tax that's going to be incurred to actually go build a system that's going to let you do that. And so what I've, what I've come to discover is that SaaS-based logging lets me have that moment where I have the spark and I say, I need to log this, especially if it's like a, a Docker container or something else that's going to uh, uh, be horizontally scaled or it's going to come up and down based on an orchestrator. And I'm not going to have time to dig into that thing in flight and figure out where to apply logging. I go ahead and set my configuration for that, to send that off to Paper Trail, and then it just magically appears. And then I can go back to it, and I can search. I can basically tail through that, lo that big aggregated log. I can, I can search for individual systems or sorts of events and figure it out later, but it means that I start capturing that data immediately when I was not only in the mood, but really had the opportunity to invest that, that, that little bit really of time. That you really have to do it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of yeah. takes all the pain away. Exactly, exactly. And where Logly comes into place is, you know, you need something more than just live telling for troubleshooting use case. You have something was wrong, right? Single place right. log, and you need something more. Meaning, you need to look at those logs and do some analytics associated with that. Let me look at the logs over a six month or a year period, and let me look at uh, Apache or Nginx logs and different error codes associated with that. So you're uh, talking about actually extracting data from the, the log data themselves, not just sort of log frequency, but actually like the JSON that's part of uh, a metric that's coming back as a part of a, a logged event, actually being able to chart on that. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I'm glad that you brought up JSON, right? So look, look at it. Like people are looking at logs a lot of times nowadays is, you know, traditionally it has been sys logs, right? It's a mm -hmm. simple way to look at logs. But a lot of people are moving towards more the structured logs, right? Mm -hmm. Like using the JSON format to do, uh, using that format to do a, a much easier filtering, slicing of dicing data. Of course, if you, in order to start doing that, you need to be able to do a parsing the right, the logs as they come in. Right. And once you parse that through that, you can see it a nice graphical view in terms of different logs and start doing analytics associated with that. And this is what Logly is really fantastic at. Okay, so let's do this real quick. I want to show, just briefly show Paper Trail. And then let's go to Logly and kind of compare the difference between that sort of live tail aggregation, put it all in one place, or, and then taking that next step up to be able to generate metrics and dashboards off of the data that's contained in those logs. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, so most of the time when I'm in Paper Trail, I am using the event view, which is what we're looking at right here. So this is a live tail of all of my aggregated logs, right? Yeah. Now, if you, when you're in production, of course, this just streams by and you can't really see that much because if you have uh, millions of events that are coming in per day, that's going to go by pretty quickly. So it makes it easy to go in and I'll just slice it by maybe a component of or a component of an application or maybe drill it down to a particular device or an IP address or a lot of times what I'll end up doing is saving a query that will pull just the data that I need like maybe out of my AWS infrastructure for example so that I'm only looking at those logs. So it effectively gives me uh, lets me tail something that's running somewhere and I, I don't need to worry about where it is. It's going to be coming up here and then I can search it out after the fact. Absolutely. Um, but what I really like about it, as I mentioned before, is what got me to this was, was the first time I went and added, and I, I recommend everybody, you know, you, there's a, a free tier here you should definitely check out, but adding a system is really straightforward. You're going to click Add Systems. So for example, um, here, I've, this is uh, just regular OS logs off of Linux. All I'm going to do is just cut and paste this script directly into my environment, or more likely, you're going to have Chef or Puppet or some other uh, automation tool actually apply that. Um, in the case of like an application uh, log file, it's going to actually, for in this case, it's a remote syslog. It's going to give me the setup for that as well. So yep. I don't need to I don't need to figure it out. Um, uh, it, and in this case, if I want to do custom config files or some other options that I can do as well. So it makes it really easy to get from hey, I wish I had data that was coming from that environment to a dashboard where I can actually see all of my events. Exactly. And it's a SaaS solution, right? So you don't have to set anything up, install anything up. All you have to do is sign up, 
go to the uh, your configuration and start pointing test lock and you're good to go and this is what you're going to get. Right. So I've been playing with this for a long time and actually I showed at uh, Flat Camp this year you guys saw that I was monitoring Orion with this uh, doing alerts on it. So I was monitoring a, I was basically exporting a heartbeat and if that heartbeat stopped then it sent me an alert if it said I haven't seen this heartbeat in five minutes so that I could know that a remote instance of the Orion platform server was running out in AWS. So it, it, it ends up solving a lot of edge cases so it's, it's a little bit of a uh, so Army knife for me. But um, Logly is a little bit different, right? Yeah, I mean, let's take a look at Logly, right? And Logly is a lot about, you know, paper trail is all, was about looking at the syslog and live telling and seeing all the logs immediately, right? So syslog is a bit different. So you, let's say you're sending a log top of Nginx. And the great thing about Logly is you can detect that you're actually sending this Nginx log type mm -hmm. and it starts to parse those information. So like as the logs get ingested, we do auto parsing on it. And what you can do is you can start filtering information automatically for you and you can start to get like these dashboards out of the box. So things like if you're sending an Nginx log type, we detect it and we'll provide and build this out of the box dashboard. For you. So you may be looking at Nginx by Maybe different, you know, request type right method. Is it get or post or head type of lock uh, mm -hmm. for Nginx, or is it by Nginx statuses? Is it 200, 301, 302, 404? The great thing about it is you don't need to do anything, right? It's smart enough to know you're sending an Nginx log types. We're providing a dashboard information for you. And if you don't look at this information, like I said, uh, you know, across 24 hours, across a, you know. A month, six month, a year, you can get all that information through Logly. I don't have to export it, pull it into uh, a CSV file, then process yeah, it. Exactly. Okay, but don't underestimate the relative complexity of trying to untangle the messages that are coming in for logs, right? Yep. Because I made it look really simple before in the paper trail example where I basically said, hey, we're just going to go get our remote syslog, right? Yep. Or, or maybe if I'm using uh, system D and syscontrol and I'm using journal control to get my logs, I'll just go ahead and apply the exporter for that. But Trying to figure out what's coming out of a aggregated log is a trick because I don't want to have to go tell every single one of these feeds or in the dashboard that we saw a minute ago that that's actually Nginx, right? Yep. So when you look at some of these dashboards, and I'll pick one here that's a little bit different. Okay, so like this one is actually <laughs> actually looking at a lot of things, right? So we're we're looking at things like backend errors that are uh, coming off of systems, like whether it's uh, clock drift or bad timestamps, or we're looking at uh, anomaly detection, big huge help in in going through and finding literally those needles it's in the haystack of log, log and fire cases, yeah. right traffic volume um, you know or I want to break out my production errors that are running in AWS like I've actually built a dashboard that represents all, a large portion of my operation or something that I actually care about so the question then is well how did I tell it what these what these data elements were and so to your point the 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 what logly is doing here that's a little bit different than what paper trail is doing is it actually is aware right so when you look at the integrations that i can add um, they are much more diverse right so not only multiple services that are maybe part of aws but also uh, stacks um, and components like whether it's docker or it's a whole stacks or it's languages or json right structure locks right? or it's json it makes it really easy for me to add those it also makes it a little bit easier to kind of go beyond basic search for where I would just normally go in and search for a list of individual elements in, in that uh, tail that, that I'd be looking for. But actually, if I wanted to go in and look for data that is a part that's coming out of that log that's actually broken out in, into, those, into those charts, where I actually can go and look at the individual uh, components that are, that are part of that and then see a chart for activity. Exactly. The key here is the being able to like parse these logs that's coming in, either structural or unstructured logs, especially the structural logs, and be able to get those type of dashboard like out of the box, whether it's different types like Nginx or it could be other log types, as well as having a custom dashboard that you can set up and see some visualization associated with anomalies, right? Some mm -hmm. sort of the analytics associated with a longer period of time. Uh, that's what Logly is great for. Yeah, anomalies from my Golang app that's running in a Dockerized container on Kubernetes. I can actually see where those issues are coming from, and it, it's aware of those for me. And, and again, it's a sap based solutions, right? It gets you up and running very quickly. It does. And then the other thing is, I, it's sort of like the the grand, not the granddaddy. It's the the sort of the big brother, I think, in a lot of ways to Paper Trail. Uh, and the one thing that 
you guys have been asking is, does that mean I can't do live tails anymore? And you absolutely can do live tails as well. So that's 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 a part of the technology um, that's included in. Live yeah, tail. you can do live tailing, but as you can tell, uh, some of the things I think the paper trail does really well is that. Uh, that you particular use cases around the uh, log aggregation and live telling, which paper is really good at. So again, if you're a customer that's looking to like aggregate logs and want to see the live telling and be able to do like quick troubleshooting use cases around with that and be able to see that log like quickly and see that information and be able to search and filter, paper chose great. If you're looking for a information like you need to do maybe structure logs and be able to do analytics associated with that mm -hmm. and basically be able to detect different log types that's coming in, log is great for that. And automated dashboards based on the data that's automated coming dashboard. back in those logs. Yep. Okay, well, uh, Log Lake has a, a huge following. Um, lots and lots of customers love it. Um, I'm going to be out in San Francisco shortly and spend a little bit of time with that team. So I know, uh, you know, you, you like to make a joke that you're going to be able to get me to move out there, but. Uh, <laughs> Still trying. Still still trying, <laughs> but maybe. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to uh, working with that team and also spend a lot of time um, talking to you because we've discovered that a lot of our existing customers for some of our other SolarWinds products um, are also uh, uh, Logly customers and have been for a long time. Yep, absolutely. So, so we talked about uh, uh, digital experience monitoring. We showed how to do it in Pingdom, but, but at a larger level to sort of think beyond regular um, uh, user monitoring and uh, synthetic transactions, but to really think about integrating uh, business data as well. And one, how to easily aggregate logs uh, in general, but two, to start thinking about um, getting metrics that are actually usable from the data that you're aggregating uh, with all of your log information. Events. Exactly. Well, thank you, Michael, for walking us again through what the difference is between DEM and traditional uh, web performance monitoring. Um, it is also always great to have you on the show, um, especially when we have a chance to answer the questions that have come from previous episodes, like some of the other ones that we've done on cloud. Patrick, you bet. And hopefully you learned a little bit more about how digital experience monitoring is different than infrastructure, application stack, or user experience monitoring. Yeah, I think so. And especially if your chat is anything like the last time that we did a show together, you've made it clear that over the last 18 months that it doesn't really matter where your applications are running. Um, they might be in the cloud or just on premises with a lot of hybrid or maybe multiple clouds or a lot of connected services and APIs. But simply watching URL response time really just isn't enough anymore. Because when applications aren't performing well, the very first question that you're going to ask in order to resolve that issue is, what's the performance of its constituent elements? That's right. And please keep your questions coming. This is an evolving area of IT and DevOps. And we're really interested to know more about digital experience monitoring challenges in your data center. And if you don't see a live chat window to your right, that's because you're not live with us. Swing by our homepage at labs.solowins.com and check the schedule for our next live show. And Patrick, you know you're always welcome to come out and work from the San Francisco office again. I promise we won't make you move from Austin. Well, I already have an EV. Well, it's a Chevy Bolt, not a Tesla, so maybe that doesn't count. But anyway, I'm Patrick Hubbard. I'm Michael Yang. And thanks for watching SolarWinds Lab.